Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about the principles of exercise prescription. Um, so we're going to start with the FIT VP principle. So FIT stands for frequency, intensity, time, and type. And then VP is volume and progression. Um, so this refers to the most of the variables that we can adjust as we are um, working on programming and prescribing exercise for our clients or patients. Uh, so frequency refers to how often, so how many times per week, um, and that could be for any kind of physical activity or exercise sessions. Um, that can mean two a days, it could mean three times a week. Um, so frequency, there's a lot that we can adjust there. Uh, intensity is how hard are you working? Um, so um, at how, what level of METs are we working at? Or there's different ways to measure or assess intensity, but how hard are we working? Um, and then the time, meaning the duration. So how long is each exercise session or how much time are you spending in total per day or per week? Uh, then the type is the mode of exercise. Um, so what type of physical activity is it? So is it strength training? Is it cardiovascular exercise? Uh, what type? Um, so like, is it the elliptical machine? Is it running? Is it swimming? Is it lifting? Is it uh, high intensity interval training? Uh, so what is the type or mode of activity? And then volume, we can calculate by multiplying the frequency. So how many times a week times intensity by, you know, depending on how we measure that or how we quantify that. Um, but frequency times intensity times the time or the duration. Um, and so we can calculate numerically the volume of exercise. And so if we think about that equation, um, you realize that you can increase one of those variables and decrease the others and still come out with the same volume. Um, so we can tweak those different variables to increase or decrease volume, or we can keep volume the same, but change the frequency, intensity, and time um, so that we're changing the type of stimulus that is being applied so that we continue to get um, adaptation or not adaptation, we continue to get um, the benefits of exercise, the physiological changes um, to avoid adapting to the, the frequency, intensity, and time. Uh, the longer we keep the same uh, frequency, intensity, and time and type of exercise, the more we keep those, um, the faster your body adapts to those. Um, and we stop making progress. So we want to continually adjust those or adjust them every so often uh, so that we continue to make progress. Um, so progression, that is the P, uh, it's gradually increasing any components of fit. So any of our components in our little equation here, uh, we want to gradually increase those. Generally, we would do them one at a time and do it gradually. Um, so we might add an extra workout in the week, or we might make one or more of the workouts a little bit more intense or, uh, spend a little bit more time or, um, change the type or the modes so that we're gradually progressing and making, um, the training a little bit more, uh, challenging in some ways so that we continue to, um, get benefits from exercise. Uh, so for beginners um, of our fit variables here, we would generally increase the time first. So we would increase duration gradually. Um, and then after that, we would start working on increasing frequency and or intensity. Um, and then for individuals who have comorbidities, so any kind of um, disease, so chronic diseases, disabilities, anything like that, um, where maybe their activities of daily, daily living are impaired or they have very specific goals for very specific functions or things that they want to improve on, um, you would increase whichever variable is going to help them achieve that goal sooner. So although for beginners, we might generally increase time first, 
Um, if somebody's goal is to be able to walk up the stairs, like maybe now they really can't take the stairs because of maybe pain or um, cardiovascular inadequacy or whatever it might be, um, then rather than increasing time, you might work on increasing intensity until they're able to walk up a flight of stairs with, uh, without assistance or whatever their, their goal might be. Um, so you would tweak whichever variable is going to help the person achieve their very specific goals. Okay, the next principle is individuality. And that is really, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. It just means that the response to training is individual. Um, so different people will respond differently to changes in the different fit variables. Um, so for some people, increasing volume might get them better results. And for others, decreasing volume might actually get better results. Um, or for some people, if, if volume is equal between two individuals, um, one person might get better results with higher intensity and less time and vice versa for the other person. Um, so response to training is individual and unique to the person because people have all sorts of individual variables that change their response to exercise and to different types of exercise. Um, so things like genetic ability, um, our muscle fiber type proportion. So um, although on average, uh, most of us have kind of an even distribution of the different fiber types, um, some of us have a slightly greater proportion of one or another. Um, so some of us lean further in one direction or another, and then it actually can get to be quite extreme. So elite athletes in certain sports can have a very extreme um, proportion or disproportion of muscle fiber type. So that can play a really big role just depending on um, how uh, those proportions lie in an individual. And then age affects how we respond to training, our past experience with training. So somebody who's a lifelong marathon runner is going to respond differently to strength training than someone who's been strength training their entire lives. Um, mental state. So um, maybe someone just really doesn't like a certain type of training and how they respond to that training is going to be different than someone who loves it. Um, or, you know, there'll be differences in attention or ability to tolerate discomfort of different types of training. So mental state will definitely have, a, will definitely play a role. Um, and then there are just endless factors. We could probably list all day differences between people that can make them um, enjoy or dislike or respond differently to training in all sorts of different ways. Specificity. So specificity is a principle that essentially states that physiological adaptations to exercise are specific to the demands placed on the body. So they're specific to the, the particular stimulus that is being applied to the body through exercise. So what that means is if we have certain goals, we need to train specifically to help the body achieve those certain goals by applying the right stimulus to trigger the right physiolog physiological adaptations. So when it comes to cardiovascular exercise, we have both systemic and local adaptations to exercise. So systemically, when we engage in any kind of cardiovascular exercise, that's going to improve the health and efficiency of the heart and lungs and their ability to um, oxygenate blood and send that blood to all the tissues throughout the body. So that's a systemic um, adaptation to cardiovascular exercise that you really could achieve using any form of cardiovascular exercise as long as it's sufficiently intense. So as long as heart rate stays high enough throughout that exercise. But cardiovascular exercise also causes local and very specific exercise adaptations. Um, so for example, the muscles, the larger muscles that we're using the most during cardiovascular exercise are also going to increase in mitochondrial density, meaning that we're going to increase the number of mitochondria in those particular muscles that we're using so much 
Um, and you hopefully recall that the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cells. And so the muscles that we're using the most in cardiovascular exercise require more energy to support that activity. So we're going to produce, we're going to build more mitochondria in those muscles. So we'll have greater mitochondrial density. So that improves their endurance of those particular muscles. So that's local to the muscles that we're using. Um, in addition, like we also, um, the more we're using muscles and cardiovascular exercise, the more we build capillary networks to supply blood to those specific muscles. So we're increasing the circulation to the muscles we're using, and we're increasing the muscle's ability to use what's being delivered in that blood to produce more energy to support that exercise. So when it comes to cardiovascular exercise, the systemic benefits will cross over from one type of exercise to another. So like, let's say you're training for a marathon. Well, doing other types of cardiovascular exercise, like cycling, for example, will also improve the systemic effects. It will give you systemic adaptations. So the heart and lungs will become more efficient um, and that will help you towards your marathon training. But the local adaptations, if you want to get better at running, you will only achieve those local adaptations to make you better at running by running. So if you are cycling in preparation for your marathon where you need to run, you are going to have local adaptations to cycling and the systemic adaptations will cross over, but the local ones won't necessarily. It will depend on if, you know, which muscles you're specifically using and in what specific ways. So cross training is helpful because it helps to work on the systemic adaptations and helps to do that while avoiding overuse injuries, like from running too much. Um, so you can still work on the, the heart and lungs becoming more efficient and more effective without causing overuse injuries because you're running too much. Um, but there, that can only be within reason because you don't want to lose the local adaptations that occur in response to the specific way that you're training. Um, so same rules apply to strength training. Um, the muscles that we are working are the ones that are going to get stronger, which I think is pretty intuitive. We know that, um, but it goes further than that. It's specific to the way that we are using the muscles, the angles, the, um, the way the weight is carried. Um, so how we use the muscles determines what part of the muscle actually adapts and what type of adaptations occur in response to the stimulus. So even like if we compare um, adaptations to a bench press with adaptations to a chest fly, okay, well, they're both working our pec major, but which specific fibers are being worked and even what part of the fibers are being worked will change because there's a big difference between a bench press where the weight is on top of the hands and on top of the muscles and we're pushing against gravity in an upward linear direction. That is very different from a chest fly where the weight is moving out and away from the body and then the muscle is acting to draw the weight back on top of the body. Um, so it's a different type of movement and it's going to target more of the lateral part of pec major because the weight is moving so far laterally in a chest fly compared to in a standard bench press. It's not going to work as far laterally in the muscle. It's going to be more in the, the middle kind of portion, uh, middle and more medial portion of the muscle uh, because the weight is staying on top of the body on top of the muscle. So that's just an example. So it, even though we're working the same muscles, theoretically, and in, in the same way, it's still horizontal adduction in both cases, that's the action. Um, but because the configuration of the limbs and the um, how the angle of how gravity interacts with the movement, 
Um, those are different between the two exercises. So chest flies are not necessarily going to make you stronger at a bench press because you're working on different parts of the muscle. So that's a good reason to use a variety of different exercises is because you're working the muscles in different ways. But it also means that if you have a specific goal that you need to make sure you are using the correct exercises in the correct way to be able to achieve that goal because the adaptations are so specific. Okay, progressive overload. Um, so increase of work performed compared with what is usually done. Um, so we want to progressively, meaning gradually, work on overloading our muscles or overloading our bodies and whatever, um, you know, it could be cardiovascular system, could be um, strength training, so it could be muscle overload. But the point is that our our progress is going to depend on us essentially asking the body to do more than it could before. So if we just keep always doing the same thing we can already do, we're not asking the body to be able to do anything new. We're not asking it to adapt or improve or do anything it couldn't already do before. So we have to ask the body to do something it can't already do or that we didn't already do yesterday to stimulate it, to send resources there, make the muscles stronger, build more blood vessels, um, to make whatever adaptations necessary so that it can do that level, that volume, that intensity of work next time more easily. And so that's where um, the, the changes come in. So we want to progressively overload. Um, so it's the relationship between exercise volume and the benefits we get from that exercise. So there are two thresholds. There's the floor effect, meaning that we have to do enough. Like there's, there's a threshold we have to meet to be able to cause adaptations. Um, and if we're below that threshold, we're really not going to have any improvement. Um, and then there's the ceiling effect. That's the upper threshold where when we go above it, we really don't get extra adaptations or extra benefit for going above that ceiling. So the idea is that we want to work between the floor and the ceiling. We want to work between those two thresholds um, so that we're doing enough to cause adaptations and to cause progress, but we're not doing so much that our, our progress is diminishing and we're not really getting the extra payoff for the effort that we're investing. Um, so we call that dose response, meaning that the response to exercise depends on the dose or the volume of exercise. So generally speaking, a greater dose or meaning more intensity, duration, or frequency um, greater dose of exercise will cause greater adaptations to exercise, but within, within those boundaries of the floor effect and the ceiling effect. So above or below, um, we're going to have diminished returns on our, on our effort that we're investing. Um, but when we're between the floor and the ceiling, it's more or less linear. So the entire dose response is not linear as we see in our graph here, it's not linear. But if we drew a line at the floor and the ceiling, what is in between is more or less linear, meaning greater dose means greater response. Okay, adaptation uh, refers to the what happens when the body becomes more efficient and better at the exercise that we're putting it through. So the more you do an exercise, it could be the type of exercise, it could be the duration, the intensity, the more we do anything, the better we get at it. So the body is incredibly efficient. So the more we do something, the more efficient we get at doing it. And by efficient, we can mean several different things. It might mean we burn less calories. So we're spending less energy on that activity. Um, or we get better at um, moving the weight with less effort and um, costs us less resources. So the more we do something, the better our body gets at doing it, and it costs us less to do it, 
which means it provides less stimulus for adaptation or for, for making progress or, or getting benefits. Um, so the more we do something, the less that activity works to cause changes in the body. So we need to consider this principle of adaptation and make sure that we are always changing what we're doing so that we are still providing a stimulus through exercise to cause the physiological changes that we're aiming for. Um, so if we just, if like, let's say you have a training program and you just do that forever, it'll work great in the beginning. It'll work great for a first couple of months and then you'll plateau pretty quickly. You won't make any more progress because you need to change the volume, the types of exercises, um, other variables. You need to change the, the training variables so that you continue to have a stimulus and you're avoiding adaptation. Okay, regression. Um, we've all experienced this. If you take some time off from whatever type of training you're doing, you will lose the training adaptations that you gained through training because now you are being inactive. Okay, so we want to keep training in whatever way that is or whatever type of training we're doing. We don't want to stop training because we will regress. We will decondition and lose the benefits that we've gained from whatever type of training we've been doing. Um, so even if you've adapted and you're not improving anymore, it's still better to keep doing the same thing to avoid regression than to stop. So at least if you've adapted, you're at least going to maintain your current level of fitness um, and your current physiological changes, even if you're not gaining new ones. But if we stop completely, then we regress. Um, so if we don't reach a minimum dose, so we're not um, achieving a minimum volume of exercise that the body has grown accustomed to, then we decondition. So we regress to a level less than, than what we have achieved through training. Um, now, as a general rule, cardiovascular adaptations occur more quickly. So with, with cardiovascular training, we see improvements faster and we regress faster when we stop training. So we'll see quick cardiovascular adaptations within the first couple of weeks of cardiovascular training, and we will see them go away just as quickly when you stop training. Muscular adaptations, it takes a lot longer to build new muscle um, and to achieve other adaptations of muscle. So it takes a lot longer and it takes a lot longer to regress um, when we stop that training stimulus. Okay, so cardiovascular adaptations come on faster and we lose them faster. And muscular adaptations come on more gradually and we lose them more gradually. Recovery, um, rest is fundamental to any exercise program and any, any type of fitness uh, goals or anything. We have to have rest so that we can recover. Um, so we need to recover between sessions. Um, and it's absolutely critical for avoiding overtraining and for avoiding overuse injuries. Those are the two um, big uh, danger, <laughs> uh, the big dangers, the big risks uh, that we take when we're not getting enough rest when we're training. Um, so we also want to maintain motivation and interest in exercise, which are two things that go down the tubes if you are overtraining. Um, so that is a sign of overtraining is if you, you're kind of losing your motivation to keep going and you kind of are feeling like, oh, I don't want to. Um, th those can be big signs of overtraining if you did at one point enjoy your training. So um, it's one thing if somebody just has never liked exercise, it doesn't mean they're necessarily overtraining, but if somebody is highly motivated and they're training and they're enjoying it and they're making progress and at some point along the way, they're losing their motivation and they're losing their interest, that is a major sign that they are overtraining. Um, and overuse injuries, somebody, especially you see that a lot in running, but it can happen in all sorts of different activities. Uh, but somebody is starting to have aches and pains and things that, that are starting to kind of nag. They're not going away. Um, that's a sign that for one, they might not be getting enough rest and recovery in between sessions. 
but two, they might be doing the same thing too often. Um, so you might need more cross training, more diversity in the types of activities that are included in that program. Um, because like, if they're just running, 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 that's how you get overuse uh, injuries and in running. But if you're running, running, cycling, swimming, running, running, cycling, swimming, um, or especially add some strength training in there, uh, then that goes a long way to preventing overtraining um, and to preventing overuse injuries. Um, now, when we talk about rest, that is relative. So how much rest somebody needs, it depends on the volume of training, uh, what type of schedule they're on, what type of training they're doing, the intensity. Um, so when we talk about rest, it could mean like rest, you know, in a matter of hours if they're doing two a days. So like they might be um, lifting in the morning and running at night or vice versa, and they're having rest in between. Um, then we also need to have rest days. So whole days where we're not doing uh, formal training in that day. Um, so at least a day a week, there should not be any formal training. And I say it that way because um, sometimes people think a rest day means don't do anything physical. And that is not the case. Um, it's relative. It depends on you and what your training program is like and how hard you're working. Um, but a rest day might mean you're going for a walk after dinner or something. It doesn't mean do absolutely nothing. Um, it just means relative rest compared to your training that you are, you're doing on the other days. Um, and then rest could also mean a matter of weeks um, if somebody does have overuse injuries and they need to let them heal. It could be overuse injuries or it could be recovery after any kind of injury, acute injuries and uh, surgeries and things like that. So you might need much more time. Um, and rest can also be relative. Like you might need to lay off a certain exercise or muscle group or body part uh, because maybe there was an injury. Um, like maybe you can't run for a while, but you still can probably strength train, you know, that sort of thing. So rest can be relative um, depending on what the situation is and what the rest is required for. Um, generally speaking, a greater volume of training requires greater rest. Um, so more volume means you need more rest. So more greater intensity, for example, higher intensity exercise will require greater rest to recover from it. Also, generally speaking, more training requires more sleep. So if somebody cannot get enough sleep, then they should not be trying to increase their volume of training at the same time. Um, because it isn't, rest is not just a matter of not working out. It's not just a matter of having a rest day or laying off, you know, the, the running or whatever. It's more sleep too. And so if somebody is chronically under sleeping, like many of us are, um, then that is not a good time to be increasing the volume of training at the same time, because they need to get enough sleep to be able to fully recover and avoid overtraining and overuse. All right. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.